Hello everyone, good morning and uh, good morning boys and girls. I've really missed seeing you at Sunday school this past couple of weeks but I hope you're getting on okay at home and I hope you're listening to your mum and dad and I hope that you're being kind uh, to your brothers and sisters. Uh, will we pray together? Let's pray. Uh, dear God, our Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we come before you now and we recognise that you are the great King, uh, the Sovereign Lord, that you are the strong tower, uh, that you are the Father of our Saviour, uh, the Lord Jesus, and that he is strong and kind. Father, we give you thanks this morning. Uh, we give you thanks for our families, Lord. And we give you thanks for our homes. Uh, we give you thanks for our teachers in Sunday school and in school, wonder kids and seekers, Lord. And we give thanks also for our grandparents, Lord. And we pray that you will uh, look after them and care for them in these days. Lord, we pray for your help in these times. Uh, Lord, I pray that each boy and girl would look up and look towards you in these days. Uh, that they would think about you, Lord. Uh, that they would uh, search for you in your word. And that they would speak with you daily in prayer, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes uh, as we look at the world around us, even if it's just out through the window, and that we would see the beauty of creation and that it would declare to us that you are God. Lord, we pray for your help in these days. We pray for your help that we would not worry and we would not fear, Lord. Help us to rest and sleep well and be kind and gentle to those around us uh, as we spend time at home together, Lord. I pray all of these things in the name of your lovely Son, the strong and kind Saviour, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Hope to see you soon. Good morning everyone. This is now the second time that we are meeting like this on a Sunday. and We don't know for how long it's, it's going to last, but we're trusting God that he will have his purposes in it. Um, if you haven't already, I would encourage you just to pause the video even now and uh, just take some time just to be still before the Lord before you listen. Ask God to speak and minister and to work according to, to his spirit. Um, this morning our plan is to go back into Second Peter. We would started this two weeks ago and we want to just go back into this short and powerful letter written by the Apostle Peter to believers in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And as he writes to these believers, he writes um, with one big point really in mind. And that is, whatever you believe about the end is going to impact how you live today. You see, for Peter, he knew nothing of, of COVID-19 or coronavirus. But there was a poison that was spreading. There was a virus um, that was in the air and it had infiltrated the, the church and the DNA, if you like, of this virus was a denial of the second coming of Jesus Christ. These false teachers that we read about in chapter 2 were trying to um, teach believers that Christ wasn't coming again. And therefore, because he wasn't coming again, it was irrelevant how you lived. If Christ isn't coming to take his people to be with him, if Christ isn't coming to judge those who are his enemies, then... Who cares how you live? And that was the teaching that I got into the church. And Paul wants, or Peter wants to write to correct that and to call again the believers to holiness, to lives that mirror the one who has called them. And right at the beginning, he gives us this wonderful, wonderful encouragement. And it's this God has given us everything that we need for these lives. He hasn't left us alone. He hasn't left us to our own devices. Everything that we need, we have because God has given it to us in Christ. So let's just read two verses together, just verses three and four, and then we'll think about them um, in the time that we have together. So let's just read God's word. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. What we want to do this morning is just split these two verses into to three points. The first is the power that grants what we need. Secondly, the beauty that produces what we need. And then thirdly and lastly, the promises that enable what we need. So firstly, the power that grants what we need. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, we saw in our last time in Second Peter just the focus on Jesus Christ in verses 1 and 2. And Peter describes Jesus as his master, as God, as Lord. And now again, the focus is in these two verses is still on Jesus Christ. He is the one who has power, divine power. And this power is breathtaking in, in how he uses it here. Jesus is the one who has the authority, the ability, the power to grant all things, everything that a believer will ever need to know real life. And this granting of Christ, it's an official giving, bestowing. You know, you think if, if you want permission to do something and you have to go to an authority, maybe someone in the council or, or the government or, or whoever else, and you have to ask them for specific permission to do something. You know, the words used in, in Mark chapter 15. Do you remember Joseph of Arimathea? Jesus has, has died and he wants to take his body to give it a proper burial. And he goes to Pilate because Pilate is the one who has the authority. And once Pilate um, finds out that Jesus has truly died, it says he granted the corpse to Joseph. Pilate alone has the authority to give Joseph permission to take Christ's body. And here we see at the start of this letter that Jesus Christ is the one who has authority, who has the power to grant, to gift to his people all the things that we need for life and godliness. Now, consider that power just for a moment. You know, that word power is used multiple times in the New Testament and it's used often when it talks about Jesus' miracles and the apostles' miracles. But this reference has to be one of the most amazing in all of Scripture. Jesus' power is of such an extent that he is able to give those who believe in him everything that they need and will ever need to be saved to be right with him and to follow him. You know what it's like when you sign up to um, an internet package and maybe some of you have updated those packages in recent days, but you look at the different things that are on offer, the different bundles that there, there are that you can choose from. And there's all varying degrees. You've got your bronze package and it has just the basics of what it does and it, it goes right up the way to the platinum, to the very best, to the all singing, all dancing. Everything that you'll ever need is in that package. And in a sense, that's what it's like when we come to Christ. He has given us everything that we need. He doesn't just give us some bronze package. He gives us absolutely everything so that there is absolutely nothing that is missing. Nothing that we could ever want for and need to live for him. He gives us the platinum every time. All that we could ever need for godliness. All that we could ever need to be right in the eyes of a holy God we have in Christ Jesus. You know, these false teachers were spreading the poison that how you live now was irrelevant. But Peter makes clear that when God's power is at work in us, it changes everything. It doesn't just change the life to come, it changes the life that we live now. You know, as you think back to the Old Testament and um, you think of the people that God calls to himself and then he gives them his law through Moses and calls them to live in a certain way of holiness so that he might dwell amongst them. 
But as you read time and time and time again, they fail, they fall short. And you just see so clearly that even though they're called to this life, they're unable to live the way that God wants them to live. In fact, the law highlights that very fact. This power is like nothing else the world has ever seen. And how thankful we should be for that. You know, can you imagine God saving us and then leaving us to our own devices? Can you imagine him bringing us so far and then saying, all right, okay, it's up to you now. You go and get on with it. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't leave anything to chance. He doesn't leave any opportunity for his plan to fail. He is able. He is mighty. He is so powerful that he can and he does give all things for life and godliness. And it's all a gift of his grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We don't warrant it. He gives it freely to us. Secondly, the beauty that produces what we need. So how does it all work? How does he do it? What's the means by which we benefit and taste of this power? You know, I'm sitting here in my office. I know that there is a socket in the wall and it is full of power. And whenever my laptop starts to fade, I know that the power in that socket is sufficient for what I need. But... I must get the power from the socket to the laptop and do it through a plug, through a cable. And here Peter helps us to see how we come to know this divine power. And do you see it in verse 3? It's through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Knowing Christ is the channel through which God's power is mediated. Now that's not knowledge in the, the sense of facts and information. It's not that we can just study the person of Jesus Christ and, and acquire knowledge and then be granted life and godliness. No, the knowledge that Peter is speaking of is, is saving knowledge. It's the difference between, and I know some of us have experienced this in the last week or so, it's the difference between knowing that Zoom and Skype are able to connect us to other people at a time like this and actually using it and benefit it, benefiting from it, seeing one another on the screen, speaking to one another and having a relationship in that. It's the difference between knowing at a time like this that exercise is, is important and it's good for you and feeling the good of that, experiencing the good of that after you've done a session with Joe Wicks or whoever else you might do your session with. You know, the knowledge that Peter speaks of here, it's experiential, it's real, it's personal. Look at how he qualifies it. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. This is knowing a person that we've responded to, knowing a person that has called us to himself. And as he's called us, we have been compelled to come by his beauty. We've seen him as the one that is glorious, unlike any other. We've seen as him as the one that is excellent, morally perfect, pure, holy. We've seen him as the one that we need. And this call of Christ, we know that it's, it's heard through the gospel message. It's heard through the good news of Jesus as it's proclaimed. Paul in Romans 1 describes the, the gospel as the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So Christ calls us to himself through this message. What a beautiful message it is. God, our creator, our king, the one who owns us and the one to whom we owe everything, even our breath, the fact that we have lung, breath in our lungs, the fact that our heart is beating, it is all due to the grace of God. And he then has the right to demand of us how we live. He has the right 
to give us a law by which to live by. But we've refused. We have turned away from that. We've rebelled against him, against his rule, against his law. And we've decided that we are our own gods. We've put ourselves on the throne. And the only law that we will adhere to is our own law. And like any king, like any ruler that has been rebelled against in such a way, judgment is coming. Vengeance is coming. He's not just going to sit idly by and allow people to rebel against him. He's the Almighty. And he is going to come and judge. And he's going to deal with his enemies. That's huge trouble for all of us. But here's the hope. Here's the good news. There's a pardon that is offered. Because in his grace and in his love, God sends his son. And as his son comes, he steps into our place. And he takes the judgment and the vengeance that, that we deserve. He turns it away from us. Turns it away from all of those people who will bow their knee, who will confess their sin and their rebellion, who will ask for mercy and who will trust, who will believe that what Jesus Christ has done, that who he is, is enough, is what is needed for us to receive mercy. But it gets even better than that because it's not that he just grants us mercy, which is good enough. But he also goes further. He gives us new hearts. He gives us new life. And that new life then produces the new longings, the new appetites, the new senses. We see more of this Jesus. And we start to enjoy more of his glories. More of his excellencies. We see him in his word. We see how he speaks. How he reacts. How he, how he deals with people. How he shows us the Father. How he sacrifices himself for his people. We see him all over scripture. And the more we see, the more we love. And the more we love, the more we want to see. It's divine power at work in us. As God's spirit takes these things and just brings us to life in them. And it's through this knowledge then, it's through this enjoyment that we're given everything that we need. All we need to be saved, to be right with him, and all we need to live lives now that please him. It's the complete package. Nothing is left out. Nothing has been missed. It's all here for us through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. You know, what a wonderful way that God changes his people. It's not through force and oppression, but it is through a power that's unrivaled. A power that causes us to submit, but to submit willfully. A power that calls us to a beauty that we just cannot resist. A beauty that's just unlike anything else that we've ever known. And that keeps us coming back for more. You know, we live in a world that teaches us most of our problems can be overcome with more education, more knowledge. The more educated we are, then the less poverty there's going to be, the less racism there's going to be, etc., etc. All these things can be fixed through more knowledge. Well, to some extent that is true. Knowledge is the answer. But it's knowledge of a person. Knowledge of one who transforms us completely. As we come to know this Jesus Christ, he gives us everything that we need for life eternal, life as it should be. So let me ask you this morning, even as you watch this, do you know him? Not know about him. Not know information about him, but do you know him? Have you been drawn to him? Finally, the promises that enable what we need in verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You know, if there's ever been a time when people have been trying to escape from some form of corruption in the world, it's now. The world is on lockdown. Our communities are on lockdown. People hiding away in their homes, trying to escape, trying to get away from this deadly virus that's sweeping across the world. You know, Peter, as he writes to these believers, he knows that the world is sick, it's corrupt, it's broken, it's infected. And he knows that for the church to live lives of godliness that we've been called to, then we must escape this corruption. So what's the answer? You know, there's no option for lockdown. There's no benefit in believers just hiding away because we know that our biggest problem, it's not outside of us, it's within us. You know, we know Jesus prayed in, in John 17, when he's speaking to his father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. You know, so what kind of escape is Peter talking about here and how are we enabled to achieve it? Well, we can see the escape Peter has in mind is not an escape from the physical world, but rather from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You know, we can self-isolate for the rest of our lives and the desires of our flesh will keep coming. We'll think wrong things, we'll feel wrong things, we we'll long after wrong things. And again, that is what makes the gospel so amazing. It's not just a religion that gives us commands that we have to grin and bear. It's not a God who calls us to live in a certain way that we don't actually really want to live, but we just have to suck it up and get on with it because we don't want to get punished. No, this God gives us everything we need for life and godliness. That means he calls us to this life of faith. He gives us new hearts that want to live this life of faith. And he enables us to live this life of faith. And the way that he does it is through his precious and very great promises. You know, the glory and the excellence that believers have been drawn to in Christ now is the source of wonderful promises of grace. When we come to Christ in saving faith, in him all the promises of God are yes and amen. And it's in through these promises that we can become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now Peter isn't saying there that we're going to become little gods. It's not that we suddenly become divine beings ourselves, but rather we get to share in the excellence of Christ. His moral excellence, his uprightness, his purity, his holiness, we are enabled to display in some part that divine nature, that godliness in living. Do you know, it's not the people who claim to perform signs and experience the miraculous that give evidence of partaking in the divine. It's those who have escaped the corruption of sinful desire and live lives of godliness empowered by the Spirit. So what does it look like? Well, in Peter's mind here, the promises that seem to be in view are those promises of salvation, of calling, that we've just thought about and also the, that promise of of the return of Jesus Christ you know it's ultimately through these promises through these precious and great promises that we escape the corruption that's in the world you know Paul begins his letter to the Galatians with these words grace and peace to you from our father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age it's through the gospel promise, the promise of God, of mercy, of grace in Christ Jesus that we escape this present evil age. But I think that there's also other promises in mind here and other promises that help us then daily to escape from sinful desire and to pursue godliness. So what I want to do just as we finish is just to think on, on one example of this and, and how it works. 
I just in the day to day. You know, this is a time where many of us are fearful. And for Christians, there is that same temptation. But when we think through the temptation, we soon discover that it is attractive because of sinful desire. Let me explain that a little more just in way of, of myself. One of the most obvious desires that I see within my own life just now is I want to be in control. I want to be the master of my destiny. I don't like the fact that I'm not in control of, of the things that are happening. And now if that's left unchecked, what happens? I fret because I've lost control. I worry because I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know the next phone call I'm going to get. I'll cling to every area that there's still a glimmer of control that remains. And I'll cling to it and I'll hold on to it in a way that's not in keeping with what I'm, I'm called to as a follower of Jesus Christ. So how do I escape this? Well, consider this promise that is mine in Christ Jesus and is yours in Christ Jesus if you have trusted him as Lord and Saviour. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold, I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, when I take that truth, when I think on that truth, when I have faith and believe that truth, then it enables me to escape the corruption that's caused by sinful desire. It enables me to take the desire to be in control, to be my own God. And it enables me, in a sense, to slay it and to remember, I don't need to be in control. God is with me. He's told me that I don't need to be afraid. He's told me that he will help me and strengthen me and uphold me. It's him who has that righteous right hand, that hand of power. I don't have it, but that's okay. As I meditate on that, then I can be a partaker of the divine nature. I can enjoy peace. I can enjoy rest and joy instead of corruption. You know, God has given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. Nothing has been forgotten. You're not going to open the box and find that a piece is missing. All he has called us to, he has enabled us for. And what a wonderful truth that is. What a gracious and great God we serve. It's his power that grants everything that we need. It's his beauty that produces what we need. It's his promises that enable what we need. I hope that that is a help to you. Let me just pray for you as we close. Father, thank you again that in Christ Jesus we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Father, help us to remember, help us to trust in that, help us to, Lord, ever look to you for all that we need, knowing that in Christ we already have it. Father, we bless you. And Father, I just pray for all of those now struggling with various fears and anxieties, various ways in which sinful desire maybe is bubbling up within. And Father, I pray, Lord, that again they would know the joy of resting in your very great and precious promises and knowing, Lord, that portion of the divine that they can enjoy even through that. So, Father, help us, we pray. Lord, use your word for the sake of your great name and for our good. 
And we ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless.